This is the Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 15th of February, 2021. I am joined on the show today by my friend and all-round awesome human being, Jess Johnson. She is the legislative liaison and advocacy coordinator for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation. She's been on the show a handful of times before. She is a listener favorite. Uh, we cover a spectrum of topics today. From we, we start off talking about the importance of uh, wildlife crossings, very quickly transition into the very controversial topic of introducing or reintroducing wolves. And then we get into what is the bulk of the podcast today, which is her involvement in the mountain goat cull within the Grand Teton National Park. It's a, it's a very important story for purposes of wildlife management and some of the moral issues we have to wrestle with while we're thinking about management in general. But it is also an edge of your seat experience. I will say no more, but just start listening and listen listen closely. Jess is such an amazing guest. Before I jump into that, a quick shout out to this week's top tier Patreon supporters, Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, James Martington, the guys at South Asher Stalking, Josh Starling, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, and the team at Galax Clothing. Uh, of course, our podcast partner is Modern Huntsman. I'm the conservation editor uh, for that publication. We run a competition every two weeks, so this week is running over from a week ago and all you had to do to be in with a chance to win your own copy of Modern Huntsman uh, was subscribe to their their mailing list. So head over to modernhuntsman.com, find the subscription box and put your email address in there. If you'd like to find out more about Modern Huntsman, just head over to modernhuntsman.com. And with all of that said, I will hold you up no longer. And please welcome Jess Johnson to the show. Jess, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing wonderful, and I'm excited to be back. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think when you were last on. Was it, it must be more than a year ago, or maybe no? Actually, it wasn't that long ago. You you came on one of the science shorts. Yeah, yeah, I think it was the science short where we were talking about some some hunting issues in Alaska. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, excellent. Well, I mean, I'm pleased to have you back on again uh, as a repeat guest. <laughs> it is an absolute pleasure. I'm really just sad that I haven't had a chance to see you in person for more than a year. It's yeah, what a year it's been too. And, um, you know, as always, I think on the phone call when we were talking about recording this uh, episode and, and how you and I tend to go off into our own little uh, wormholes of policy and, and wildlife stuff. Um, I, I've missed it and I've missed it in person over some whiskey. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it wouldn't be whiskey for me because I absolutely hate whiskey. But <laughs> you can drink. You can drink all the whiskey in Scotland you like. Um, I will not be participating. A twenty-first birthday ruined that for me. Oh, oh, rough. <laughs> yeah. Now, just for for people, maybe they haven't, uh, they didn't hear your previous um, conversations with me on the podcast. And I would encourage you, if you're listening to this one, to go back and listen to the old ones. Just remind people, what does your day job? look like? Lay, lay us just a, a little bit of groundwork before we dive into this really uh, intriguing and exciting, uh, what's, what am I going to call it, experience that you've had recently? <laughs> yeah, so um, I am the Government Affairs Director for the Wyoming Wildlife Federation, which is mainly a fancy way of saying that I am a lobbyist. Um, and and I am my day job is dealing with hands-on wildlife policy that affects hunters and anglers, wildlife conservation um, within the states. And, and I am Wyoming specific with most of my state stuff, um, but I do uh, dabble in the federal side uh, as it is a hobby of mine and, and an addiction really at this point. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's, it's all wildlife based and, and, you know, whether it's talking about like how we manage landscapes with long migrations that goes over you know, public land, private land, state-owned land, all different sorts of things and to uh, how that is reflected at, at leadership side. So for me, it's the Wyoming State Legislature um, or often uh, the national uh, delegation in D.C. So what is, if you were to pick one or two um, highlights of policy issues that have been discussed recently, either in your state or generally speaking in North America, 
what are the what what are the go to conversations that you've been having recently? Uh, well, one actually works both for for within Wyoming and outside of Wyoming, um, and it's my personal favorite one because it's bipartisan in a real way. <laughs> Uh, meaning that like, uh, it's not a, it's not split on a political divide, um, but it's wildlife crossings. And that being, you know, uh, as we are figuring out all of these migrations, um, for mule deer or elk or bighorn sheep or moose, all of the science is happening with GPS collars on these animals. So we can actually pinpoint directly where they're coming into conflicts. And a major part of that conflict is when wildlife tries to cross roadways and doesn't make it all the way across. You know, that's a public safety. It's, it's it, you know, a safety of drivers. It's a wildlife safety. It's a continuation of keeping the migration. Um, and, and the neat thing about this is that we have a solution. You know, wildlife crossings uh, are underpasses, overpasses, fencing and signage work that has proved to work. You know, there are wildlife crossings installed in, in Utah and uh, Arizona and Nevada and uh, Wyoming that are over 85 to 95 percent effective of mitigating any and all wildlife crossings in the area that they're at. Now, the over over what, what kind of an area? I'm wondering. Uh, it can be within like a, you know, it, well, in a large area. But the nice thing is, is that because of this GPS collaring technology, we know the exact specific area that these animals are crossing year after year after year after year. And so it, it's mitigating longer stretches of road than just the place where the crossing's at. Um, because we have this like perfect roadway of GPS points, um, that tells us, you know, a mule deer crosses at mile marker six every year and they do it and they've done it for, you know, the three or four years that this mule deer has had a collar on and, and mule deer B who has another collar on crosses right in that area as well. And, you know, mule deer have high fidelity, which means they, they, uh, they go back to the same places. They're very, they have good memories. <laughs> um, and, and, and are very habitual in that sense. And so, you know, there'll be fencing work to, to funnel wildlife to this crossing um, that can stretch for, you know, any manner of mile in either direction. Um, and then it funnels them to this crossing. They get across. The migration exists. We mitigate roadway accidents with citizens and drivers on our roads. And everybody's sort of happily ever after. Now, the legislative side of this is the fact that that one overpass can cost twenty two to thirty million dollars over a two lane highway. And, you know, if it's a state owned highway, it's up to the state to come up with that money. Um, so the, the major bear of this that is legislative is funding. Where do we find the funding? How do we come up with it? We have to get creative. So some of the things I've worked on is, is Wyoming uh, implemented a vanity license plate that has a big mule deer on it. It's $180. $150 of that plate goes into a conservation account specifically for wildlife crossings. And then there's a $50 fee to have this plate every year um, that you pay. And so it's this sort of it was the beginning of the snowball of finding funding. Um, but that was a piece of legislation that we passed. That was a bill. Um, and then you go forward into like, what's the next step? Um, you know, some, some, uh, some additions have been adding a little square. <laughs> sounds kind of morbid, but when you go in for your driver's license or your registration for your car and you can sign up to be an organ donor, <laughs> you okay. can also sign up to donate to wildlife crossings. Um, huh. And and things like that, and that oh, was an, on 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 your deathbed. Yeah, apparently uh, okay. it's, it's not nice. for on your deathbed though. It'd be like I, you know, I'm paying for my registration. I'm going to add. Oh, sorry. Bucks. Okay, got yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought when you said it was the same time as like ticking that you can take my organs when I die. <laughs> it's like when I die, you can take a portion of my my, my <laughs> estate to fund crossings. Okay, yeah, I got it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it's all of that is legislation. It has to be passed in law. Um, and, and so it's a bill that's written and you have to lobby it through and you have to talk to uh, the legislators and the decision makers and tell them about, you know, why it's important and why everybody should care about this and how it helps them and how it helps their constituents and their voters. Um, and that's, you know, that's what Wyoming's been doing statewide. We have other stuff that's been moving, um, at least legislatively, uh, soon. Our, we're in the middle of our legislative session really right now. Um, but 
you also think about this as if it's not on a state owned uh, road. So maybe it's on a, on a federally owned road, like an interstate um, or a freeway. Uh, that's not just state funding. And so this also goes to the national level where uh, we're starting to look at large scale infrastructure bills for the U S that includes funding for wildlife crossings and, um, our senator in Wyoming, Senator Barrasso, has been a really amazing support around this and, and has, has included this in a lot of the infrastructure bills that he's put forward for highway infrastructure um, because he, it, it, it is a bipartisan issue. It's, it's, it is a problem. We have a solution. It is an effective solution. We just need to find the funding. And the other side of that is that we're saving money by building these. Um, you know, it pays for itself in 12 to 25 years uh, just by the cost of mitigating crash after crash after crash after crash. Um, and so really, it's kind of like one of those things where like, there's no downside if only we had a thousand, you know, dollars for this. <laughs> yeah, it's um, just a bit, it's finding finding the source of funding. I mean, I think it's funny you bring that up because I, this podcast isn't out yet, but I interviewed Jake Willers, mm -hmm. who's um, a documentary filmmaker, essentially, uh, for Caribou 9 Productions, if I'm getting his production company right. He's actually a British guy, but he lives over in the States now. And he put out a film in 2019 um, for the state where he lives. And it was about, uh, it was a short doc about wildlife crossings and the importance of them. Oh, and that's they, awesome. they showed that, like, they showed that this process, he actually filmed it over a couple of years. So they showed the process of the studies leading up to it and the number of accidents that were occurring on the road uh, and the construction and design of these crossings and how and why they work. Um, so yeah, that'll probably like that that podcast. Even though I've already recorded, it, will be coming out after this conversation with you. Uh, so people can look forward to that if they want to go and hear a little bit more conversation about wildlife crossings and be linked to the the video with Jake. Well, that's perfect, and 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 really, it is. You know, it, it's been my favorite issue to work on, um, mainly because in in the uh, political climate that uh, the U.S. has been in currently. <laughs> It's really, really nice to find something that is a middle of the people road. People can agree on. Bipartisan yeah. issue that people agree on. So, and it's, it's good for wildlife. It's good for people. And it's it's a nice feel-good issue. But it also has teeth. You know, it, it is hmm. a significant um, depredation to our, to our populations of wildlife. It, and if we can mitigate that, uh, our populations will rise. <laughs> hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, this is actually a risk to human life, too. Oh, very much so. And, and that's, that's the, the, you know, even if it's not a fatal accident, um, you know, it doesn't have to be fatal to really mess up someone's uh, livelihood and life. And, and, and uh, I think the average uh, wildlife collision cost, at least to person when it, when you look at whether it's medical costs or, or car insurance and other things is 11,000, like $600. So it's not a little amount that you're saving like individuals either. <laughs> the polar opposite of this kind of conversation. And it's maybe a bit unfair for me to ask you to like really dive into this because we, we should probably do a science shorts on this like we did before. But is has been the recent discussion in the last couple of months about reintroducing wolves. Oh, yeah. Ah, it's a yeah. little bit more controversial, that one. <laughs> well, just a touch, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so what, just without us spending like the next hour talking about this, where do we sit with that? Just give people who are not aware about what I'm talking about specifically um, a rundown on what's been what's been happening. So you know, Wyoming Wyoming has been the sort of uh, pilot project, if not like the birthplace of the reintroduction of the wolf in our neck of the woods. And you know, starting in Yellowstone, and and starting with a certain you know number of reintroduced wolves, knowing that they will propagate and multiply and spread out from there as they do because they are smart canines. Um, and so it was very, very, it's always going to be controversial. Wolves just, they seem to just touch on that like lizard brain in humans. And it's, it's <laughs> either in a like shivers up the backbone kind of way, or it's in a uh, like fuzzy love kind of way. And I, as I've seen it, 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 they are some of the only animals that I've seen inspire like, fanatical love and fanatical hate. And so um, obviously you can do an entire short on why that is. Uh, I think we're very culturalized into distrusting um, 
uh, carnivores. <laughs> yeah. uh, just, but, just as a, a pause of your thought, I, did I tell you I saw wolves in Yellowstone when I was in Montana a few weeks no, ago? No, no, I didn't hear that. I did. Oh, is so it, that was that's my first proper wolf experience was watching <laughs> wolves in Yellowstone a few weeks ago, which is amazing. It's it's always like awe inspiring, and and I think you know at some point we see ourselves in them. Um, they're smart. They're smart yeah. hunters. Um, and and that which is a lot like us is something that humans don't like very often. Um, it's very so true. when you live in the wolves' backyard and you think about this being Wyoming, um, it's a lot of agriculture, and agriculture is is this incredible way of life with livestock and and you know it's the old cowboy way, and there's very few left, and it's a scraping by existence. Nobody gets rich running a ranch. Um, ranches are what you buy after you're rich now. It used to be that like when you ran a true ranch and you ran a cattle operation, you know, you were really scraping by and most of them are still here. And so when you lose livestock due to depredation, so wolves, you know, come in, what are they going to hunt? Are they going to hunt an elk that is wicked smart? Or are they going to hunt a juicy hamburger standing on the side of the road? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's so they're perfectly they're, aged. <laughs> exactly, they're not. You know, to no, no fault of their own. They're they're smart, and um, so there's conflict a lot with agriculture, and and because Wyoming is such an ag based state, um, clearly that that inspired a lot of consternation and pushback to the reintroduction of the wolf. Um, that has continued. You know, we have lived. I would never call it harmoniously, but we're figuring out how to live with these carnivores in our backyards. Um, and, and it's just, it's, we're wrestling with this balance every day here. Um, you know, the balance of, of having a good ecology that is supported by predators that keep populations healthy and keep the landscape um, working as opposed to removing something that used to be here forever and, and calling that okay. But, you so know, there's always the these most issues. Recent the, Where was the most recent introduction being suggested? They haven't done it. Was it Colorado? So yeah, and and here's where the problem came in is that that Wyoming's population is spreading across the state, and and is naturally moving in all directions out from Wyoming. It's the animals don't listen to borders, and so Colorado had a ballot initiative, um, which made me nervous to start with. I, I hate ballot biology. Um, <laughs> But it, a ballot why is initiative. that? Is that because it's not necessarily? It's not like based. It, it's more on a gut feeling and opinion rather than science. Is that why? Yes and no. Most of the times, if it's made it to the ballot, it does have some science behind it. It's not just like a blatant emotion. Um, the idea being, though, is that a ballot initiative uh, puts science up to be voted on by the maybe caring but not quite scientifically educated uh, community. Um, without putting out all of the discussions in front of people. And so this ballot initiative to reintroduce wolves in Colorado blew up because it's very popular in urban areas because that's, you know, not the areas that deal with carnivores. I was gonna say, yeah, because they don't have to live with them. <laughs> yeah, because they don't have to live yeah. with them. But but it's you know the idea of having wolves around is 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 wonderful. And personally, I love it. But I, it, it's also romantic and it touches into sort of the hallmark wild and things like that. Uh, so so the urban centers of Colorado uh, are really the strong points of voting centers as well, and the rural centers of Colorado are the ones that are having to live with this um, and deal with this, but also really know the impacts of it in their own lives. Um, and so it was really controversial. And the argument here is that, you know, quietly, what I would say is that had we not made this a ballot issue, had we not shined a spotlight on this, wolves are already moving into Colorado from Wyoming, <laughs> They're there. Whether they're being introduced as such. Uh, whether like, they're being uh, introduced or not. With human hands, yeah. Exactly. And so this was like introducing with human hands wolves versus letting them naturally spread into areas that they're going to naturally go and sort of fit between the seams of these uh, areas that, that they're applicable. And, and so rather than wait for that, we want, are wanting to reintroduce them. And... Um, 
you know, from my perspective and dealing in the political arena, the closest thing that you could do to just major detriment, especially on wolves, is to shine a spotlight on it and make it even more controversial than it already is. You know, it, it's already a sticking point. It's already something that there's lots of high emotions for. And then when you add the political side of it, when you make it a ballot initiative, when you shine a light on it, and it, it, let, it gives room for the crazies to rise to the top rather than sort of like the quiet middle um, to just sort of deal with it as it comes and deal with it case by case as, as conflict or no conflict happens. Um, and that's kind of like, that was where I, I personally had an issue with the ballot initiative is it's not that I'm not for wolf reintroduction or that I'm not for having wolves uh, everywhere that they are applicable, but it's, it's the fact of like how we do it and are we creating a lasting uh, effect that is negative on the wolf in the long run, because we've, we've just, I mean, the best thing we could do is just be quiet about what's happening and let it happen and see this landscape come back and see how this works out. But when we put headlines on it that are inevitably inflammatory wording, you know, the last one we talked about or the last podcast that you and I did, we, it was based off of an inflammatory wording, of, yeah, of, which was very far from the, the reality of what was happening on the ground. Which is exactly what it is. It's inflammatory wording. That's that's the that's the ethos that is then prescribed to the whole issue of the wolf, rather than looking at, you know, the the really beautiful nuance that's there. Um and so that's what did where you think? I worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What what did you think about the uh the response from the hunting community from the ballot in Colorado, because it kind of, it didn't make much sense to me. And, and well, and I, you know, I, I was seeing a lot of the response in Wyoming. Um, can you refer like what, what you saw? That so, oh, was- so it was just very negative to the reintroduction. And I was just thinking to myself in the long run, if sensible management, uh, of uh, growing populations takes place, and there's precedent for that in other states, then this is like another opportunity to hunt another species in the long run, probably not in the short run, uh, in the short term, sorry. Um, I mean, I, I can kind of get it because people are maybe concerned about reductions in populations of species which they see as, as in inverted commas, theirs, you know, deer species. And uh, the agriculture is a slightly different discussion because a lot of hunters are not farmers. Uh, they might hunt on farm land, but they, they don't have a, a direct vested interest in that. So it's more to do with, is it infringing on their ability to go and hunt? And by and large, I saw a very negative view about the idea of reintroducing wolves there. Yeah, and, and I might be wrong, but that was that was my impression. No, and and we see that here in Wyoming as well. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a really unpopular statement right now. Oh, do it! I love it. <laughs> uh, That's what this is all about. <laughs> having predators in the landscape does not, will not affect populations to a level where a hunter can notice. What affects populations? And I'm not saying they don't affect it because they do a little bit. But if you think about it, these are animals that have been on this landscape together for way longer than humans have been part of this picture. They, yeah. Elk and deer know how to live in a landscape with wolves. What they don't know how to do is live in a landscape with people. And <laughs> that is so well put, Jess. Thank you. <laughs> And and they're so, still working that out. The they're land, still the, working the, that the, out. The human manufactured landscape. Yeah, and and you know the whitetail has it pretty well figured. Elk and mule deer are a little bit behind. And and you know when you look at like when when you blame population decline on a predator, you better be looking in the mirror when you're doing it. Um, <laughs> so true. It's, it's so true. And and the, and I think the vitriol comes from the fact that wolves are a direct competition for humans on deer. Um, yes, you know we are both hunters, and sometimes we're hunting the same deer and and or the same elk. And uh, you know there is behavior change. You know if you think about it, elk behave on a landscape without wolves very differently than how they behave on a landscape with wolves. Um, I would argue one is more natural than the other. Uh, but it, it, uh, when we're looking at, at, 
where this hate comes from. I, I, I think it's been misplaced. I think we're seeing major population decline because of human created problems, whether it's habitat loss, fragmentation, whether it's climate change or whatever's causing things. Most often it is human cause and a human cause issue. Now, the one caveat I'll give is that if you put a very efficient predator on top of all the human caused issues, it does have an effect. But, you know, at what point are we more, uh, I, I guess my argument is, is how do we have more of a right than the wolf, which is a wildly unpopular opinion. But <laughs> uh, I just, I've seen us, I've seen us do it right. We have a litany of science, whether it's talking about the coyote or the wolf, that yes, in very specific scenarios, sometimes um, really, really targeted hunting on a population of predators during a specialized targeted time, like when, say, mule deer are fawning and you go out and kill a bunch of coyotes right in that fawning area, you can help a population bolster its numbers. Um, the downside to that is that a lot of times you're falsely inflating it because likely the deer are dying for a different reason longer down the road. Um, you know, when you talk about carrying capacity of landscapes and density dependence, which means like a landscape, you know, say a square acre has the ability to sustainably house, you know, so many mule deer. Uh, and if they get over that, number so they they propagate and and they have many fawns and everybody's doing well but now there's too many mouths on this one acre and that then diminishes the nutrients at which each one is getting so yeah you might have more deer but they're all more unhealthy and more unhealthy and more unhealthy and at some point that population that balloon is going to pop and so if you if you're falsely inflating that and it's going too fast and that balloon pops then you have this just plummet so you have a hard winter or you have a drought year or something happens. You have a disease move through. And, you know, as we're all talking in a world talking about density dependent diseases, the more deer you have stuffed onto a landscape with lowered immune systems and, and not as healthy, and then you have a d disease rip through it, it's going to kill way more than if you had a smaller amount of deer on the landscape that were healthier, had a better immune Um and, and sure, there's less deer, but they're more healthy and they're a better population. So when you look at populations and you see mountain peaks and valley floors and you see this like really aggressive up and down, um, that you're looking at a population that probably actually isn't doing that well. Um, and they're either getting falsely inflated or things like that. Or if you're looking at sort of a bell curve and these ups and downs and these natural rises and these natural declines, that's what you see more when you have predators managing a population, people being included in that. Um, so my argument with the predator thing is that just vitriol hate for a predator on the base aspect that they are competition for you doesn't actually come out in the science. And there is, a, you know, if people are angry about this, come to me. I have a binder that is about a foot <laughs> wide of studies we to can, back this up. <laughs> we need to do we need to do a deep dive into that at some point. We, we definitely do. So I, I want to change tack here and talk <laughs> about a trip that you did. Uh, when was it now? Even was it end of last year? October? November? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually end of September, beginning of October of last year. Okay, so um, I, I mean, I'm not going to give any intro to this. Just to tell us how this came about, uh, what it was before you actually put your feet on the ground. Well, on the, uh, I guess it's in the same vein of in controversial conversations uh, and controversial policy decisions. I, a little bit of the history here is, is we're going to talk about mountain goats and we're talking about mountain goats and the Grand Tetons. Um, okay, get, to just explain for non-Americans uh, where the bouts the Grand Tetons are. So when we're talking Grand Tetons, we're, we're talking very, very, very northern, northwestern Wyoming. Um Right next to Yellowstone National Park, it's Grand Teton National Park, um, and it's some of the more iconic landscapes when you look at American Western art uh, that, that's very recognizable. They're these very pointy mountains. Um, they're incredibly aggressive uh, in, in terrain, and uh, they house one of the most pristine populations 
of Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. And and they uh, the, the cool thing about this bighorn sheep is is that they have uh, their 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 genetics you can trace back almost to the Ice Age in the Tetons and. Bighorn sheep have been doing poorly across America, across Canada. They're they're in trouble. Um, they're very sensitive to diseases, pneumonia being primary. Um, that that the disease that just takes them out. And and so we have this really pretty genetically pristine population of sheep in the Tetons. They're kind of on an island, so they have the same kind of like sensitivity to species as any island species would. So like if they get a disease, it can rip through there and really just decimate this population almost in entirety. So what does this have to do with mountain goats? Um, a while back, uh, we reintroduced mountain goats in, in Idaho and, and in an area that they were uh, native to and, and mountain goats did really well. <laughs> and, like the wolf, uh, spread outside of where we thought they would stay. And we started seeing mountain goats in the Tetons, which does not have a historic population of mountain goats. Um, and so what's this have the issue with is, is mountain goats carry, uh, the same bacteria that can cause, uh, it's called MOV in Rocky mountain bighorn sheep does not affect the mountain goats like it does the sheep. The sheep, it can decimate the population. The goats seem to hang on with it, but they certainly carry the bacteria. Now, as these mountain and goats... The, the, oh, go for I it. I was just going to say, this is, they, they, they can also catch it from domestic livestock. I think maybe that would be how most people are, are used to this transmission working. Yes. Yeah, so most of the problems that we're hearing about around bighorn sheep populations actually doesn't have anything to do with goats. It has to do with domestic sheep. Um, cause they do carry it as well. But in this particular population, domestic sheep cannot make it into the Tetons. <laughs> uh, this is, this is a, again, not terrain for the faint of heart. Um, and, and these two animals, these two species have started coexisting in the same place. Now the worry here is that with these goats that are carrying this bacteria, this pneumonia, um, you know, they're using the same mineral licks. As, as the bighorn sheep, they, they, goats are really solitary. They're not quite as banded up as sheep are. So goats really just, they're, they're these very effective spreaders. <laughs> they go everywhere. Um, they're, they, like the sheep, are incredibly rugged and, and deserve a ton of respect for being able to survive where they do. Um, but, the, but the problem here that we're finding is that, that you have a non-native species in an area that is transferring bacteria that causes pneumonia that could wipe out the native population of very genetically pure <laughs> bighorn sheep uh, in the Tetons. And so it's kind of this wrestle. It's, it's how do we value management? You know, do we, do we give a higher value to the native species? Um, you know, the mountain goats are this incredibly, uh, this incredible species. It's also deserves to be here, but they're not native. How do we deal with this? Just, so, <laughs> um, to, 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 before we before we go further, so just to tackle with the native non native issue. So, um, hopefully, I was listening uh, with enough attention a moment ago. They found their own way there from a previous in reintroduction somewhere else. Yes, so they got previously. So, re who is to say that they weren't there historically? I mean, just because they weren't there in our records, if they managed to go there by themselves in a very short space of time, really, I mean, who's to say they weren't there? What the likelihood is, is that the bighorn sheep population likely kept out um, just through through habitat use much okay. else. But because the bighorn sheep population isn't doing so great, they are leaving sort Got of it. openings in habitat um, for, yep. for goats to habitat as well. They, they use landscapes similarly, but not the same. Um, sheep, I think, are a lot more... Uh, I, and I could be wrong about this, uh, but they, they, they use landscapes in different ways. The problem is, is that some of those uses overlap. And because of the disease issue, it makes it not okay. Okay. Um, whereas, and, and, and mountains and goats are doing, as a population generally, and I, I, hopefully I'm not mistaken in this, you can correct me, they're doing pretty well in most places, aren't they? So well that when we were trying to get rid of our mountain goats, nobody wanted them. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. So um, the issue here is we've got one population that is uh, not in any d- real danger or risk and is actually thriving, not just in that state, but across the entire country for the most part and act- exists in Canada as well. And then we've got this other species, which is really struggling and has a lot of threats uh, and uh, pressures on it, which are depressing populations. Yeah. And I, I would caveat that with, I would never say that mountain goats are thriving, but they're, they're certainly a little more stable and a little less okay. prone to major die-off. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> that, than, uh, than bighorn sheep are. Um, but they're also, I mean, I think the other side of this is these are two incredibly charismatic animals. You know, the mountain goat is something that we see on posters of, of, you know, national parks and, and they inspire this, this mountain climbing. And, and from a hunter's perspective, they are really, both of these species are kind of this, uh, heartthrob of a hunt, um, because you get to go into this incredible terrain. You're, you're going after an animal that is wildly better suited than you are to this place. And uh, it, no, we're it, just visitors. We are so just visitors there. And, and you know, having been on a doll sheep hunt and and now a, a mountain goat, uh, which is a little teaser, I, I, I don't know which one is harder. I have so much respect for both of those species. But because it was so charismatic, because there's a deep following for both, this conflict that happened exploded into a bigger conflict, which is like, what do we do? How do we how do we save these bighorn sheep? Uh, how do we do it in the right way? And here's the caveat. This is in the middle of a national park. How do we do this? Um, and and, Where, and just, just for more global context, in the middle of a national park, was there no hunting previously? Like prior to this conversation we're about to have about controlling a population, was there no hunting inside that park? Uh, the only... N- yes and no. Uh, I, unfortunately, this is the one park that does allow hunting. They do it for elk, and it's very, very regulated. Um, and it's it's again due to a population. But but for sake of this uh, of this story and this, um, there is there is national parks do not allow hunting. There is not a history of hunting in national parks uh, since they were designated as parks. Um, so. As this came up, people are just juggling with like, what do we do? How do we handle this? Um, you know, and and when you're dealing with really charismatic animals, as you see with the wolf and the grizzly bear, emotions go real high uh, when we start talking about how we eliminate one or the other. And the national park, to their credit, I mean, they just they they were in a really rough position. Um, they have to work with Wyoming Game and Fish. And everybody was on board with this idea of we have to get rid of these mountain goats, but the idea is how. Um, And so the park wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with this and came down to the fact of that they were going to aerial gun them. And uh, so helicopters shoot on site kind of deal. Yep. And and the reason for that is a very valid reason is is the timestamp on this. It's incredibly time sensitive. The longer we wait, the more likely a transmission of this MOV pneumonia um, is to happen with these bighorn sheep. And, and it's it's going to take one or two. And this population is just going to be in such big trouble. Crash, yeah. So so you have to remember that that this is like, it's not comfortable, but there was such a timestamp on this that they went, okay, this has got to be the most efficient way. We have to, we just have to make this decision. And it's distasteful. Like the optics were bad. Um, and as expected, the reception was even worse. And they did one day of aerial gunning. I think they killed 36 goats in 24 hours. And, and the Wyoming governor uh, put in an order to stop it at the federal level um, because people were Was mad. there a public outcry? There like, was, yeah. Was it, you, yeah. Both sides. Both sides were really mad. The, the, when you look at the like, animal rights activist side, that obviously looked horrendous <laughs> um, to, to be aerial gunning them. But then when you look on the hunting side of it, they were, there's a lot of hunters going like, wait, like we put in all our lives for mountain goat tags and you're like, we'll, ha- we'll go do this for free. Like let us in there. And, but and is there, 
I see that, you know, I see that argument and I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I guess we're going to dive into this as we talk about the story and, and how, how difficult it is to actually do it. But even without that knowledge, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at this, like not as a hunter, but as a f more from the perspective of a wildlife biologist, not, not that I am one, but I'm trying to think like that and the, the time restrictions that are in place. And well, that might be unpalatable. I, I find the, that view from hunters as a kind of a selfish view in a way because it's like, well, I'm upset because I've had the opportunity to go and hunt something taken away from me. Whereas really the discussion in my mind initially from the way that you've laid the groundwork right now is how can we do this as fast as pos as fast and efficiently as possible? Because the, the real goal here is to stop a dramatic crash in the population of sheep. And and so Not mountain I, goats. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. And, and, and I think the other side of this is that, and this is, this is what I love. At some point I want to write a piece around this and I haven't quite got my head wrapped around it, but, but what I faced on this was a direct confrontation of ethics and efficiency and where they cross and where they don't. And, um, you know, this aerial gunning, they were not retrieving the carcasses. They were leaving them as they lay um, because you can't, you know, like, especially if you have a helicopter, you can't go down and to these crevasses and canyons that are straight up and down. I mean, sometimes hunters can't even retrieve the goats that they shoot. And uh, it, it, so you, you have this thing of like, we're doing right by the bighorn and are we doing right by the mountain goat? Because you're you're saving a population at the detriment of of mistreating an individual, and that is See, such a like oh, it's such a hot button issue. And, and, and it is, and it's it's really you know what's interesting to this. And I actually was having this discussion the other day about this idea of of morality and around the concept that in nature there is no morality animals mm -hmm. other than humans nothing no other living creature makes moral decisions on anything mm -hmm. so when we're talking about le and i'm not necessarily i'm not advocating for one or the other we had a very similar situation kind of in some regards of carcasses being le left by the john muir trust on a, la a large area of ground where they wanted to reduce the population. They said it was too difficult to take them out. I would disagree with that. I don't think it was as difficult as they made out. And they left a lot of stags um, dead on the hill, those carcasses to rot. Is it, in terms of an animal welfare issue, I, there is one, as far as I can see. As long as those animals are shot and killed efficiently and cleanly. There's no animal welfare issue. There is a moral issue as to how much does it bother us that there is a carcass rotting on a hill that wasn't utilized in another way. And it's to me, it's more about net gains. And so I can, if you sit down to sit down and look at this in a more sort of black and white way of what are the primary goals here? Can we do it without animals suffering? It is not ideal that we can't take carcasses off the hill and make use of that um, resource. But how much does that really matter? It's not an animal welfare question, that. That's just yeah. to do with the death. It's really like, it's it's what's good in a, how we live with ourselves, you know, when we go to bed at night, I think has been, you know, you, you hit it again, just like right on this, this, this problem that they're wrestling with. And, and so, I, you know, some of it is that there wasn't, as is with public agencies and, and federal agencies and, and even state agencies, the communications around their decisions only go to the people that are really keyed in. And so, so the outside public didn't have, and not at the fault of the agency, it's just the way things are, and didn't have an, a grip about what was going on until a story came out in the Jackson Hole newspaper that said aerial gunners slaughter 36 mountain goats you know or, yep yep uh, that, that headline will do it <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know the, uh, the governor just got inundated you know i think he made the only decision he could he appealed to the to the federal uh level and and they put a stay on the aerial gunnings so they only killed 36 goats and and then it went back to the drawing board there was about a hundred a hundred goats in that area i think and it was they killed about 36 of them i could have the numbers a little bit wrong but that's the general i'm in a ballpark there <laughs> okay. uh 
so they went back to the drawing board and they said, okay, well, how do we handle this? And, um, they, they decided to, to offer a hunt and, and the way that they did this is, is they, they created this hunt as, as quote unquote qualified volunteers to go in and shoot mountain goats. And you signed up in teams and so, cause you, they don't want you going in alone. It is, I cannot stress how, uh, I would even, I would call this landscape violent. <laughs> it is violent landscape. It I is a it. violent landscape. It is, it is just, it's rocks. It is straight up and down. It is class five scrambling. Like it, it, it is, uh, dangerous. It's life threatening to do this. And so they went in and said, signed up, uh, teams and by this point, you know, I'm in policy in Wyoming. I've been watching this explode. Uh, I've been seeing these different arguments. And, and I went, well, I want to I want to be in this. I want to hear this from a perspective of a participant. I want to see this. I want to be a part of it. And so I signed up uh, with a team and I did not draw. Um, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is a lifelong mountain goat lover and he signed up for reasons very much like I did and this like watching this conservation saga unfold wanting to see it and be there uh knowing that he loved mountain goats wanting to be someone that knew that if he was pulling the trigger he was pulling it with intention and care and respect um even if it was to eradicate this animal and so he gave me a call and he said hey I drew and I have open spaces on my team do you want to come Obviously, I was like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so how they ran this is, is that they broke the Tetons and this mountain goat habitat up into zones. And you had zone one and three and eight and nine. And you put in for a zone and you drew it or you didn't draw it. And then you got a, a five-day period to hunt that zone. And you would be, you know, maybe you'd be the first team in that zone. Maybe you'd be the second, the third, the fourth, depending on what uh, timing throughout this little season you drew. Um, we drew the Moran Canyon zone, which is the one we wanted um, mainly because it's, it's one of those zones that when you read about it on blogs or you talk about people that have been in Moran Canyon, they've never, ever, ever, ever gone back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it was like hell it's hell it's it's uh, a yeah. uh, and i can say this from experience you know we walked a mile and a half and it took us three and a half hours um it's it's snarly and undergrowth and s stickers and uneven footing you know most of that mile and a half you walk on logs where you're walking over different terrain or you're scrambling hands and knees on boulders um but but we picked this because the less people in an area, the probably more wildlife in an area. And our team was really great. So we had Jared Frazier, who is the leader of our team, and he is the executive director of 2% for Conservation. Yes, he's, we've had a conversation on the phone before. I'm going to get him on the podcast at some point. He's fabulous. And, and you know, again, his his reasoning for being a part of this really came from like that conservation ethos that's just down in his soul. We had Calvin Herring, who also uh, works for 2%. She's amazing and, and just a powerhouse in her own right. We had Craig Okraska, who is uh, a marketing director for Maven Optics, um, but a phenomenal photographer, uh, of which he'll get a really great cameo in the story. Uh, <laughs> myself uh, and Sam Dwinell. And Sam Dwinell, uh, if you guys have ever seen the movie Deer 139, um, if you haven't seen it, go watch it now. Uh, you'll love it. It's I have a story. seen the trailer, but I haven't watched it yet. It's a story of a researcher who follows the mule deer that she collars, and it's a really lovely story. You learn a lot of science about mule deer. But Sam is the researcher uh, who has collared a lot of mule deer and bighorn sheep in the Tetons. She has put hands on and done research on these sheep that we are working to save. And so she came along as well. And, you know, it, the thing is, is you got five days and you had one day that was uh, a, a sort of orientation. And, and let me tell you, the national parks blew me away with this orientation. I was kind of skeptical because, you know, they don't really deal with hunters. They don't do hunts. They don't have hunting messaging. 
And, and we were all a little skeptical how that was going to go. And, and when we showed up, you know, you had to do a, a, a shooting accuracy test um, and, and they required the use of copper ammunition um, within the national park. And you had to do a shooting accuracy test and you had to hit within a, a, I think it was a six inch circle at 200 yards. You had to do it six times and be able to continually hit it. They give, gave us a science lesson on, on why the need was for this and, and how to communicate around it and, um, you know, why they made the choices that they did. Uh, they gave us, I mean, basically what they were doing and they gave you this giant yellow band that you put on your backpack and, and front of your shirt that says qualified volunteer. And they just drill into your head over and over and over again. Right now you are working for the national park service. You represent us. Like if you run into people, you know, they're sending us out to a national park with camo on and bright orange with guns slung over our shoulders. Like this is not a normal sight that most people enjoying their national parks see. Um, and so they gave a lot of introduction about how to deal with that if you do run into it. Um, the other neat thing about this area that we drew is it's all the way across Jackson Lake, which is a four mile paddle by canoe and kayak. That's so cool. <laughs> I am, I, I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I know a little bit about this story, and I was so jealous when you told me about it, the adventure that this was. No, and not even because of the, and I, you know, this is why you were there, like, n- not even for the opportunity to hunt in a place like that, but just had to have the excuse to do that adventure. It, it really was. And, and, you know, we're hunting in a place that, you know, there's, there's stories of bighorn sheep hunters in Moran Canyon before it was a national park. And, and, you know, it's well over a century since that's happened. And so we were getting to see this place was totally through a different lens than most people ever get to see a national park. We were giving clearances to, to camp in places that nobody is allowed to do that. Uh, you know, it, it was really privileged. Uh, it was, it was an incredible privilege to be in there, but we were in there with a job and the job is somewhat sobering because the other side of it is shoot every goat you see. That means kids, nannies, males. It's not just like where hunters go in and they try and pick one male. It's like, if you see five goats, you shoot all five goats. I don't care if they're all babies. You kill them. And uh, we had the ability to take the meat uh, from one goat a piece uh, if we shot them. Um, but it but it's sobering because you're going in there, you know, it, it, there was a lot of elation and excitement to be in this place and to have this really incredible opportunity. But there was a lot of somberness in our group with the charge that we had, which which, you know, we're all based in science. We all believe in this, but but it's still sobering to point a rifle at a baby animal and pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And and you know, again, we go back to to ethics and efficiency and and where that science overlap and how that morality feels. And it's very different from like just reading it in a paper to having the gun in your hand and, and being responsible for it. It's and, very different, and it's it, it's easy. It's a lot easier to stand back and make these rational, uh, educated and informed decisions about what needs to happen on the ground. And I've had these discussions with people who like totally get it and totally agree. The difference is that they've never actually had to be the person to also go and do it. Yep. And and that was the whole reason. It's, I think there's every something one in that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was that was the impetus between I think every person on this group wanting to be a part of it is is questioning that feeling of 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 being the decision maker in something like that you know uh, uh, Aldo Leopold's you know ethics is what happens when no one's watching you know well what is <laughs> yeah, it when exactly, literally yeah. everyone is watching this is a national park this is national news this is a big deal um, like this is a chance for hunters to put a good foot forward to talk about it in a good way. Um, and also face some really hard discussion. Um, so it was like, it it was this amazing feeling, but also there was a lot of somberness I think in it as well, but back to the adventure side of it, it's like a, you know, we had two canoes and I was in a little, this is funny. I was in like a waterfowl level kayak. So not like your real sleek, efficient kayak. And we were doing like four miles, um, to the, to the mouth of Moran Canyon. 
and, and they had asked us to camp at the mouth and not in the canyon. Uh, one, because there wasn't many places to camp in the canyon, but also um, we're camping in places like thick with grizzlies, thick with all sorts of different wildlife. Like they just asked that we were kind of quietly away to where the public couldn't see us, um, but, but to camp at the mouth of the canyon because it's probably the safest and then to day hunt out of there. And, and so, um, and, and I'm sure I'll include some photos, uh, because we had the lovely Craig Okraska with us. Uh, but, but these mountains that we were at the base of were, were just like, it's the stuff of legends. We're at the base of what's called Bivouac, Eagle's Nest and Moran. Um, and Moran Canyon just runs right up the center. And the neat thing is, is that actually Sam had been in this Canyon the two weeks prior, uh, on her own little adventure and had spotted four goats. So we had a, we had a beat, we had an idea about where we were going to find them. Um, we put together sort of some, some plans of how we were going to do it and did the four mile paddle, sat in glass that first day and woke up bright and early the next morning and, and went into Moran Canyon. Um, and this is really, I think where the story starts, <laughs> Uh, like I said, you know, we went a mile and a half and it took three and a half hours, um, and got in and got to, uh, got halfway up Moran mountain. Uh, and we were glassing across the Canyon, looking at the face of bivouac and, uh, finally saw a goat and this, you know, nanny and kid kind of come out of the trees and, just the first time you see these animals, um, I'd seen them a couple of times, but never, never quite like this. And, and the first time you see these animals like be bopping around rocks is <laughs> pretty much the most impressive athletic feat you'll ever witness. <laughs> they have little Velcro feet. They stick to everything. Um, they were just hopping around and moving with ease in landscapes that had just royally kicked our ass. Um, <laughs> And, and so we're looking across at these and, and we make the decision to send uh, three shooters downhill uh, with S Sam as a backup. And then I was going to stay up on Moran um, and, and uh, glass across. And that way, if they made a shot and the goat fell, I had eyes that could see if it fell in a crevice or where it went, where you probably wouldn't be able to see it when you were close enough to shoot. Um, so I was the spotter and I was sitting up and, and they left and went down and I was watching the goat and, and, you know, uh, sitting up there and I kept having pikas like popping out at my feet and pikas are little, they kind of look like tiny bunny rabbits with short mouse ears. And they make these little sounds where they come out and they look at you and they yell at you and they go, ee, ee. <laughs> Um, and I kept having these pikas come out and they would scurry around the rock. So I was very used to these like rock feeling and, and I'm just like glued to the spotting scope, staring at these goats and hear some rocks go above me. And I was like, that sounded too big to be a pika. <laughs> um, <laughs> and turn around and 15 yards uphill from me is a male grizzly bear. <laughs> What? And I had not even noticed it because I was just glued to the spotting scope. And, and uh, it was a younger Grizz. And he, I like turned and I like startled a little bit. And he turned and he startled. And I think both of us kind of had the equal, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, and he like looked at me for a couple seconds and then just turned tail and ran. And I just like sat there and was like, I, 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 I think I... I don't know what just happened, um, but I had this incredible interaction with this bear who will come back later in the story. Uh, and so I was like, okay, great. There's a grizzly bear up here. Good to know. Um, I'm going to pay a little more attention now. You know, we'd been bear aware. We'd had a lot of seminars around that with the national park, but until you see one, it really just kind of like reminds you to be bear aware. Um, yeah. And so. Uh, How long did it take you to come down from that? Like to for the adrenaline to come down. Oh, like, was like, there at any point that you were thinking, "Oh shit"? Oh, every yeah, I was thinking, "Oh shit," and then I like became really aware that I was totally alone in this really exposed landscape that I can't move fast in, um, with only a can of bear spray at my hip. Um, because the other thing the National Park Service said that like you know we could not do is like the last thing that could ever happen is have a hunter shoot a grizzly bear in the middle of a national park. 
Um, we just don't go there. It was more like, you know, obviously they're worried about our safety first and they were really good about that. But it was like, there was that little bit of nod of like, okay, if it's going to be you or the grizzly, it better be the grizzly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, because that would just be a PR nightmare to deal with as well. Oh, as oh a, yeah. Wow. A, yeah. You didn't want to have that. So we were really drilled with bear spray. I felt very safe. But, you know, that it's when you're alone and you have bear spray and you see a grizzly bear that's seven times your size, you still feel it. <laughs> and so it took me about a half hour to come down. But it was it was also a really amazing experience because he, he was as startled and freaked out as I was. And he just like when you look in the eyes of something like that and you're as close as I was, it was an experience I won't forget. And it was a good one because I didn't get eaten. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased you didn't get eaten, Jess, because it would have sucked like not being able to talk to you anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was feeling, you know, that was uh, it. Looking at this hunt, um, I came out of it with a healthy respect for my own mortality. Uh, the, the, The hunters below ended up blowing the goat. The one thing I would think was really impressive is they were about 700 to 1,000 yards uh, from this goat when this goat, I think, caught their scent and got real savvy on them. And that goat was just, uh, she and her kid were just out of sight and out of mind in seconds, you know, ran up and over this mountain that would take us three days to to get over. (laughs) Um, and, and so we went back that evening. Um, I shared the grizzly bear story. We'd seen some moose actually further up the canyon as well. And it, it was just a really beautiful, lots of wildlife, really incredible, incredible day. So day two, we do the same, same idea. And um, we go in and same place. We knew the goats probably were going to be kind of back in that area. Uh, we actually opted to stay lower. And there was this little... Oh, say 50 yards across opening in this just incredibly thick jungle of underbrush. I cannot stress how hard it is to move in this canyon. You know, like we were what I would call trust falling into willows to part the willows so we could get two feet and like just sort of scrambling and climbing through there. And then we open into this little uh, opening of a meadow it has a game trail going right through it. Um, and we're like, this is perfect. And we can see where the goats are going to be by like laying down and putting our binoculars up and looking, you know, that's the the angle that we were looking up is that we could lay down and look up at the goats and uh, waited for them. And uh, this park service had had been really great in outfitting us with things like uh, little GPSs and in reaches uh, where you could basically a satellite phone that you can send a text on. And, uh, they had asked that we check in with them once in the morning and once in the evening. And I got a notice that time that while the check-ins were going through and they knew we were safe, our GPS points weren't coming through. So if something were to happen, they wouldn't have like a last logged position for us. Um, and so I walked in, you know, everybody's kind of laying down around looking up at the goats. I stood up, left my backpack and my bear spray, walked 50 yards and stood at the other edge of the opening with my arm up trying to get a GPS uh, point to send. And at this point is when I started hearing footsteps <laughs> running. And not from a human. Big ones. I think the words that came out of my mouth was big mammal, big mammal, <laughs> grizzly. <laughs> um, of course, you got grizzly on the mind at this point. Exactly. And and total grizzly on the mind. And I'm looking And in the span of like a couple of seconds, I see this brown hackled hump come from the brush at this barreling run. And I thought I was going to die. I backpedaled because I immediately went, I have no bear spray. But I at that point had been big mammal, grab your bear spray. And so Sam Dwinnell and Jared Frazier had both been able to grab their bear sprays. I was backpedaling. Um hit a rock and took a trip that is probably the hardest fall I'll have in my life. I think I lost teeth on it, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, it just one of those bone jarring falls. uh, And as I'm like kind of tripping over backwards, I, I kind of get next to Sam. Sam's a little bit behind me still. And I look up 
And it's not a grizzly, but it is a young bull moose who is maybe 10 yards in front of us. And he's come to a screeching halt at the corner of this meadow. And he is wide eyed and panting and really scared of something, which is our best guess, a grizzly. Uh, He has been running hard and he is young. He's kind of like, doesn't have full antler. Like he's just this like little twerpy dude, but he's still a moose. So he's the size <laughs> of a horse. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he's so scared. And, and I watch this. I will never forget this. I watch this moose make this decision because he was much more scared of whatever was behind him than the five humans in front of him, which says something about fear. Uh, <laughs> And he made this decision and he kind of did like this equivalent of like, if you just close your eyes and run really fast through something. And he like took this big breath and just ran at me. And he was just like, whatever, she's smaller. She'll bowl out of the way. I'll get through. And he hit right, like sort of brushed past me. I had like footfalls, like next to my body and my head Sam let loose on a bear spray from behind me. So spraying bear spray into the moose and me paints him red on one side. He veers towards Jared Frazier, who then releases bear spray from his side and paints the moose and myself red from the other side. And the poor moose having been hit twice with bear spray just blindly runs off. Um, But he, it worked. It was like he hit a wall when he hit the bear spray he veered off. No one was hurt. In the, the charging of, moose will kill you. Yeah, like, let's I mean, just make absolutely. that very clear. It, it's it is a life threatening situation. I truly grizzly bear or not thought I was going to die. Uh, this fo- phone was smashed up. My backpack back strap had moose prints on it. From that was how close. Like it just came. It came very close. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing I can say is that bear spray really works because all of us were coughing and choking and crying uh, in the middle of this because it just triggers every mucus gland in your body. Um, and uh, the thing that's really amazing about this story is, is when I said, grizzly bear, grab your spray, Sam Dwinell and Jared were such quick response. Um, they grabbed their bear spray. They had it unhooked and ready to go. Craig O'Kraska grabbed his camera. His camera. <laughs> High five to that person. <laughs> and we That's have a true a, photographer right there. We have a photo of the moose in perfect focus, mere milliseconds before he charged um, that Craig got. And then we have a lot of subsequent post uh, moose charging uh, photos as well. And, and, uh, you know, though, like it, the, the bear spray, Sam was, she is, oh my God, that woman has nerves of steel. Uh, she, she just like sprayed the moose, then like helped me up and was like, great, we should go kill some more goats. And I was like, everybody else like, whoa. So, so <laughs> um, you, you're only in for five days. So you, what do you, you got sort of three days ahead or two, two and a half so days ahead. Or something this now? is, yeah, this is day, uh, the first day is orientation. The second day was our first day of the hunt. This is the second day of the hunt. Um, we end up seeing, seeing the goats, but at this point it's like three or four o'clock and, and it's a three hour hike out and then, um, a mile and a half paddle to where we were staying. So it's, it's not like, it's a major, major effort to even get into where the goats were. And so we have to leave because the park had asked that we, we limit the amount of time we spend walking in the dark. Um, again, when we're talking about hunters, we're all really used to going in in the dark and coming out in the dark. But when you're looking at like safety and things that the park was worried about it made that's sense. fair yeah. they were like yeah maybe don't hike in the dark and really thick grizzly bear country with most of charge um, well the last thing they want is, is somebody to get injured or die on exactly. an operation like this so i i can i understand it to a point yeah yeah exactly and and so we hiked out um the next day was basically day three and we did a very similar similar thing um, I will say I was head to toe black and blue. I was so beat up from that Oof. fall and just shook up. And um, my backpack, you still can't walk behind me because people choke if I start sweating and it hits my backpack. <laughs> even now? Even now. 
It's the bear <laughs> That's disgusting. Whoever made it's your so backpack, bad. I think, needs to give you a new backpack. I think you should reach out I, to I, me. So I, give me a new backpack. I know. I need to tell Stone Glacier about it because it's uh, oh, the backpack go. was amazing. Hit them up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hit them up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so, so we were all beat up a little bit at that point. And, and I cannot stress this terrain that we were going through because it really – when we were climbing to get to where we could even see a goat or things like that, it, I mean, it, at times it was the kind of thing where probably to do it again would be nicer to have ropes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, and I, I, and I can't wait. I haven't actually seen any of the pictures from this trip, but I can't wait to see them. And I'm, I'm guessing that at some point you're probably going to write up the intricate detail of this of this story and then we can direct people to, walk, to yeah, it so that they can yeah. read. hopefully for modern huntsman I, I think it's it's a perfect fit for modern huntsman but just as we're kind of getting to the the end of our 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 conversation t- for today what was the uh, and, and and just to leave people on like a tantalizing hook that they can when when this d- story does come out <laughs> in written form i can i can direct them towards it did you were you successful in the end what was the kind of big takeaways from that experience not as a the, the experience of nearly dying twice. Uh, <laughs> but if, if we were to, to go back to the kind of start of our conversation, which was this um, organization of management in, a, in very controversial circumstances. So, so there's, a, there's actually pretty, I think there's a positive takeaway here for me. And, and, and in the sense of like, uh, our team was not successful um, at, at killing a goat, we actually shot three times and had clean misses. They were long shots. Um, we weren't getting able to get closer. I think 500 yards was the closest we could get. Um, some due to terrain, some due to just those things are damn savvy. <laughs> yeah. And that's just uh, the reality of being on the ground in that environment. And I, 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 you can absolutely correct me if I'm speaking out of place here, but I would, and I, I'm maybe basing this actually, if I'm remembering correctly, on my conversation with Jared, which is that there were shots being taken, and I would imagine not just by your team but others as well, that under normal hunting circumstances wouldn't have been taken. Exactly. Uh, but they were because there was a very, very clear mission here, and it yep. was that goats needed to die. If you're to boil it down to one thing, black and white, that's it. Goats needed to die. And you're having to make these decisions. Should I be taking a shot over a longer distance? Because I just, the light is going at the end of the day. So either I take a shot now and I achieve, you know, one step towards this goal that we're, we're trying to make, or I don't take a shot and then there's zero opportunity to achieve this goal. Exactly. And it's really hard. And you have this really ugly reality. And this is where it, we had to check in with ourselves. And, you know, I think, it's, it's very hunter specific. I don't think there was one right way to do it, but the idea of like, okay, so maybe there's goats that are in a line, you know, no hunter is ever going to take a shot at an animal when they see another animal standing behind it. No good hunter. However, if the point here is to kill goats, even an injured goat is likely a dead goat. And so taking into your gut and being like, if we shoot and they're say stacked up or, or, we don't have a lethal shot, but we have a very major wounding shot. You know, you had to check in with yourself because like the ultimate goal is to kill these goats. Um, you know, obviously what you want is a clean and ethical shot. If you're not presented with that one, do you still take it? And that was something where I still, I still, and this is maybe why I haven't written about it yet is I'm still wrestling with like what the right answer would have been there um, within myself. Um, and, and we took shots that were, that were very, very ethical in the sense of like, they weren't stacked up. It was a clean shot. It was broadside vital shot, but they were far, they were 500, 600 and 700 yard shots. Um, and, and, you know, most of us, even like 200 is pretty far for like what we would take on an animal in a normal hunting situation. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really weird. I think the one thing I will say though, is that, that this hunt, you know, we had these animals patterned. And so we were able to leave like GPS points, specific data, great places to find water and things like that for the next team that went in. And the team that went in after us went in on day one, didn't have to look for them or find them and shot the goats. Like, so our, 
our intel and our data point did what it needed to. It got people in fast enough to where they could take those goats out and kill them. And so at the end of this hunt, and they actually had to cut it short because of weather. At the end of this hunt, I think they killed 46 goats, uh, which is... Over how long, Jess? Over, it was about a month and a half. And It still seems less efficient than 36 in one day. Certainly, certainly. But of those 40-something, I think 38 were able to be retrieved. Okay. Um, and, And so I think the takeaway here is that maybe this balance of the two, and I think everybody that was in this hunt, including a Wyoming Game and Fish Commissioner at that point, uh, took away with, with the fact that yes, a, a helicopter is wildly more efficient. Um, but, but it's good that this hunt happened and that, that there was more messaging around this. Um, likely I think what's happened and I can't remember if it's already happened or if it's going to be happening this spring is the national park is going to go back in and finish off, uh, they're not going to hold another hunt in that. They're going to finish off with another another helicopter. Uh, How many did they need to – what was the target? Do you know? Well, it, there was 100. So they killed 36 or around 100. They killed th- mid-30s with the first helicopter pass over. They killed 40s with the okay. hunting. And, so pretty and close so, then. Yeah. It's, it's not a big job. I mean, it's a huge job because you have to hi- fly helicopters in the Tetons. That's not belittling it, but th- there's less goats to kill now than there would have been. Um, and so the takeaway is really, you know, we, we've had this incredible conversation about ethics and efficiency in the larger population versus the individual. It's really brought about, you know, the national parks had to start looking at hunting in a different light. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that came out of this, you know, Olympic national park, uh, also held a mountain goat hunt. Um, and they had, it was, a, they had way lower numbers than the Teton one did, um, of, of efficiency. So I, it brought about a new thing to start looking at wildlife management in a different light, you know, um, and, and using hunters and where hunters are applicable and, and maybe where hunters were not applicable. And, and we now have the data and the story to do it. And I can selfishly say I've hunted in a national park, which very few people can say. <laughs> um, Jess, but, this, is yeah. being, this is such an incredible like dive into our minds and how we think and perceive this, these different and very complicated and nuanced aspects of wildlife management and care. And it, these kind of conversations that we're having, we need to have them more and we need to be uh, analytical and, and critical on both sides and try and try and view these decisions with the eyes of people who don't agree with yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, and it's really important. I, I try my very best to do that and put, to put any biases I have to one side so that I can really try and understand, you know, what is the what is the what is the decision that is truly in the overall best interests once we take into account uh, populations and, and different species and land management and people and it's there is normally not one answer uh, <laughs> but we definitely need to be uh, you know calmer I think and it's more the, willing to listen and have conversations yeah I think it's it's the sticking point about policy is that often it's nuanced and wonky. And a billboard doesn't cut it for conveying what what the problems are we're wrestling with. And, and we've tried to boil down politics into campaign slogans and, and easy to sell digestible sentences. Um, and I think the best thing we could do for politics is to, one, take it off Twitter. Uh, but <laughs> two, <laughs> two, it's kind of been done. <laughs> to require a little bit more, uh, you know... If, if you're going to come out swinging on something, at least know the nuance and, and be willing to be wrong about it. Um, yeah. Because you're willing I, to be I've wrong. That's, wrong. That's key. Yeah. 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 I've certainly been wrong. I'm wrong all a- the bloody time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and things like the, the, the mountain goat hunt, you know, when we're taking other things, lives in our hands, um, you know, you have to treat it with kid gloves. You have to realize that this is, this is, a, a decision that only a human could ever agonize over. And yeah, yeah uh, you're absolutely right. That's an incredible responsibility. And it's, and it's one that we should never take lightly. Jess, this has been 
so much fun for me. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to have this conversation with me. Uh, I know that you're going to be, well, we have grand plans in the world. We have plans. For you to, be, to, be, to be back on the show, maybe, maybe, just putting it out there on a more regular basis and maybe something that could be really, really a lot of fun. But that's all I'm giving our listeners right now. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we must speak again soon. Ah, oh, thank you. It's been so good to talk to you.